publications we, we had uh, uh, last year. Uh, and uh, it's in QVD. So basically, there are a bunch of papers in, uh, in, this, uh, in this collection. And then the second one is a review paper. If you're interested in the topic, you can check out the, these two uh, uh, review articles. All right, first, I'll, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction about cryptography and what's the problem with the uh, conventional cryptography. Then I will talk about the entanglement. Uh, in the uh, next part, I will talk about the, the, the connection between the uh, security and the entanglement. Finally, I will briefly mention uh, practical security. All right, cryptography. So we know that the information security is uh, really, is really um, uh, funding, uh, funding stone for the today's uh, technology, right? Like internet, right? So it's, uh, it's closely related to the national security and the individual privacy. And we also know that the, in, the, in, this, uh, um, in this world, there are some organizations and people, they are interested in our, uh, this kind of our privacy, right? So um, how can we do, how can we do uh, secure communication? So that's a, that's a big question. So that's the, that's the topic of the cryptography. So we know that the uh, cryptology has um, mainly has two parts. One is cryptography. Uh, it's the, that's the science of encoding and decoding secret message. So if we think about that, cryptography is really on the defender side. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's give this uh, a simple example. Alice tries, tries to send a letter to Bob. So in order to, um, so someone in the middle might in, intercept this uh, letter. So that's why Alice locked this letter and then sent it to Bob. With the with the uh, proper key, Bob can unlock the message and then uh, he can read it. So so if we think about that, the cryptography is on the Alice and the Bob side. So they are trying to make the whole communication secure. And uh, there's another side is crypto analysis. So which is uh, uh, on the hacker side. So without the key, can you hack the system? Can you read the message without the notice of uh, Alice and Bob? So that's the idea. So there's always two sides. On a, on, a, on a story. So it's cryptography, it's not a new science. It's not, it's, it's very old. Actually, um, if, if I checked the Wikipedia, so you can see that the um, uh, cryptography has been existed like uh, almost like uh, 4,000 uh, 4, years. And also this is a picture I took from the Lizzie Museum. So this is a very typical uh, kind of uh, uh, encoding method like mapping. So you map A to X, B to Y, something like that. And then, so when you, when you directly read the uh, encoded message, it's like, uh, it's, it's pretty much random, but after decoding, you can read it. Okay, so that's a, a very basic idea about the cryptography. All right, so there are lots of uh, objectives of the cryptography. One is uh, confidentiality. So just uh, as we just discussed, Alice want to send something, something to Bob. So, Hopefully, no one else can read the message with, uh, except for Bob. And uh, so there are a bunch of other uh, requirements like uh, integrity. So try to make sure that, uh, so if you send us one, like uh, let's say uh, 10 pages, you want to make sure that the Bob really receives 10 pages. And that there are also a bunch of other stuff like authentication and then also in terms of copyright, so we cannot really reproduce it and also access control like uh, our computer. All right, so here I give you very basic concepts in the cryptography. So uh, we, we call it, if we combine everything together, we call it a crypto system. It's, uh, it's composed of uh, algorithm, key, key management functions. Um, so in the, in the crypto system, key is, uh, is really the, the, the most important part. So there's a one we call the, uh, Kirchhoff principle. It says that the so if you design a crypto system, the only secrecy, the only privacy involved in a uh, in that system should be the key. Yeah. So we should assume that the the hacker the hacker knows everything about your system except for the key. Okay, so that's the that's a very basic principle. So if 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 we design a crypto system like a privately privately. Um, and then hopefully that the, um, the hacker does not know how we encode this, uh, encode the message. That kind of uh, privacy is not uh, robust. Actually, if we, if we, uh, if we look at the modern, uh, modern crypto analysis, if, if you use that kind of system to the encoding a few times, 
then normally you, you can, that, that kind of system can be uh, broken easily. And also the strength of the crypto system is that the depends on the how hard to determine the secrecy associated with the system. So how hard to read out the message. So that, that's the basic idea. And uh, uh, roughly speaking, there are two types of uh, uh, cryptography uh, methods. One is a symmetric, we call the symmetric uh, cryptography. The other one is an asymmetric cryptography. So symmetric, symmetric key cryptography is uh, basically it's like uh, Alice and Bob, they share the same key. So Alice used the uh, user key to in, encrypt the message. Bob used the same key to decrypt the message. So that's the symmetric key, key crypto system. Uh, the other one is asymmetric, then Alice use one key to encrypt the system. Bob use another key to decrypt the system. So that's a, then that's a pair of the key. Of course, we can hybrid these two kinds of systems. So we know that the, uh, this kind of two uh, crypto system, they have uh, applications in different kinds of scenarios, especially for the asymmetric key crypto system. For example, those uh, we call the public key crypto system. It's very important in the uh, uh, internet. So, for example, when we do the uh, when we do the any uh, bank transaction through the internet, then we basically we use uh, employ some kind of a public key crypto system. All right. So, what's what's a key? I, I talk about key a lot. So, key is basically it's a it's a it's a bit string. So, zero, one, one, zero, bunch of uh, bits, bunch of bits, a bit sequence, bit string. So, what's the requirement, especially let, let's say for the exit for the uh, symmetric, symmetric key crypto system. What's the, what's the requirement? The key has to be identical between Alice and Bob. Otherwise uh, they cannot, uh, Bob cannot decrypt key, decrypt message um, faithfully. And also it has to be private. If someone else knows the key, then she can attack the system. So normally we name the hacker as if, okay, if stopper, if. So in the one-time pad system, so later I will introduce that, then uh, the key has to be very long. So, and also the key must be random. It's unpredictable. So if someone else can predict your key, then there's no, no security, no security uh, associated with the crypto system. Okay, so let me just introduce you very, a very simple crypto system. Okay, we call the one-time pad cryptography. Uh, so it's, it's proven, the security is proven by Shannon. Okay, so the godfather of the information there. So the idea is that the Alice and Bob, they share two identical keys, secretly, privately. Okay, Alice has a key, Bob has the same key. How do you do the encoding? It's very simple, just do the XOR. XOR basically just the uh, um, addition mod, mod two, modulo two. So let's, uh, let's give this example. Okay, so we have a message, XOR the key, and then get the code. And then Alice gets the code, and send the code to Bob, okay, through a public channel, okay, through a public channel. Then Bob gets code in, in encrypted message, and then since he has the access to the same key, so he can XOR the key again. So we know that for any bit, if you XOR twice, then you get back to the original bit, right? So that's uh, that's why Bob can get a message. But if 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 someone in the middle gets the code, let's say Eve gets the code, but she does not know, she does not know the, the key. The, from Eve's point of view, key is totally random, it's uniformly distributed. Then from her point of view, the message given the code, the message is also uniformly distributed, right? So it's not hard to see that the, this kind of uh, one and pad encryption is uh, secure, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not difficult to, um, to understand that, right? All right, so again, so feel free to ask any question in between, okay? All right, so what, why we don't use this kind of one and pad encryption system in our daily life, like our cell phone or our internet? The pro problem is that the, for this kind of, it's called one time pad. You cannot reuse the key. We cannot reuse the key. So the, so essentially the, the key is as long as the message. So the length of the key is a similar, uh, it's, a, it's the same as the message. So for example, in our daily life, every day, like uh, use, when you use a cell phone, you trans transfer a lot of data. And then for both monthly basis, like uh, you send out a, like a typical number, it will be like a gigabit, uh, gigabytes, right? gigabytes. 
So then for any communication, you have to, you have to consume so much of the key. So key distribution becomes a big problem. Okay, big problem, okay. And then I will talk about that, the, how can we solve that with quantum mechanics uh, uh, methods, okay. Before I go through that, I will give you some, uh, some ideas that the, um, so the difference between the, we call the practical security and the theoretical security, okay. I will give you one common example. So if we think about it, this, uh, if we think about this uh, control system, it's not hard to see that the, um, it is secure, right? it is secure, it's quite secure. Uh, he, but uh, I, I, think I need to emphasize that uh, it is, okay, I have a question here. Okay, let me, let me check it. Can see that coming. Do memory and the computation considerations coming. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, yes. Okay, so let's assume for the moment, so the security, we still assume that the, the Alice and the Bob's, the, the, they are local, they are locally secure. In a, in a sense that the Eve cannot just go to Eve's Eve cannot just go to Alice computer, read out the message directly. Otherwise, in that case, there's no uh, no point of the, there's, a, so there's no way to get any security, right? So we need to assume that Alice and Bob is shielded out nicely. Okay, so that's the assume. So, and also when we assume, so when we, uh, when I talk about the information theoretically secure, it means that the, we do not assume, we do not assume uh, any computation, computational power limit on the hacker side. So we assume that Eve is, uh, is uh, very powerful. She has, uh, she has uh, uh, unlimited power of the computer, uh, computation. And then she can basically, she can do anything allowed by physics, but still it's secure. So it's information theoretically secure. But we have to be very careful here. So this is secure in theory. What about in implementation? Can, can anyone think of uh, any scenario that uh, such kind of encryption system is insecure? Okay, okay, it's, 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 it's not easy to think about that. Okay, I will give you one, one example. Okay. It's okay, I'm awesome. All right, let me, let, me, let me give you one example. Let's assume that's the, um, okay, let's think about that's the uh, uh, one of your friends uh, due to any reason. So uh, he or she, she, she he cannot uh, attend uh, this, uh, this lecture. So later on, maybe uh, later today, so she sends you a, sorry, she sends you a message. Uh, let's say, let's, uh, let's assume that you are Bob. So Alice, okay, okay Alice Bob. Okay, let's uh, put that way, okay. Let, later on, then your friend sends you a message, asks that, uh, how is the lecture? How's the lecture? Okay, so I said the lecture. So do you like the lecture or not? Then you will answer to your friend, say that, yes, I like the lecture or no, I don't like the lecture, okay? All right, so, and also, but you know that the, the channel is controlled by, let's say, a hacker. So uh, the hacker, form of me, I'm the, I'm the lecturer. So I really want to know that the, uh, whether you like it or not, but you don't want me to know. Otherwise it's a little bit awkward not to say no, right? So uh, then you send a message to your friend. You use the one template encryption. So I intercept the message. I read the message, it's a code. I cannot decrypt it because um, it's one time pad encryption. For me, it's uniformly random, it's uniformly random. Okay, so you send a message, yes or no to your friend. Okay, and then I intercept the message, I try to read out, okay, but I cannot because I don't have a key. Only your friend has a key. All right, so that's a problem. But what I can do is that the, I can, I cannot read out the message, but I can count the number of characters. So, so because yes, it's a Y E S. There are three characters, and then no, there are two characters Y and O. So just by read out, just by read out the length of your message, I can know that your answer is yes or no. So that's a very typical example of the practical security. So because, of course, uh, you you can you can make some countermeasures, like uh, make all the messages, let's say uh, 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 three characters, okay? You, you add some redundancy on the, on the node, okay? So that, that's okay. But if you don't know this attack, then it's very hard for you to think about that, this countermeasure. But here I want to emphasize that the, even for a one and pad, this kind of encryption, it looks like information theoretically secure. It looks like absolutely secure. But there are still lots of assumptions here, lots of assumptions here. 
and then especially when you implement in the experiment, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the real life implementation, we have to be very, very careful because uh, sometimes uh, some side information might reveal the message. This is important. Okay, this is very important in cryptography. So in the practical uh, cryptography, control system, we do not have any absolutely security. All right, so what's the problem in the cryptography? So there were, so it's uh, again, as I said, it's like, uh, it's a very old science. And uh, also, especially in the last uh, last century, it developed very, very fast. So nowadays it's really quite solid cryptography, but what's the problem? Okay, let me, let take, let's take a look at the, how can we, how can we construct the building of a crypto system? So now on the top, it's the, um, uh, user application level, okay? So basically it's like, uh, for example, your, your cell phone, our email system, like, uh, or, or online, online banking, okay, that kind of stuff. And then it's based on some crypto system. It's based on some cryptography algorithms. And then those algorithms, normally it's based on the assumption that uh, some of the mathematical questions, they are very hard to solve by, it's very, very hard to solve by computers. So we call it computation assumptions. For example, I say, I say crypto system assumes that uh, factorization is hard. So if I give you, let's say, if, if I give you, let's say 100 digits, 100 digits number, two 100 digits numbers. And then if I ask you to multiply them, these two, two numbers, if you ask you to, if I ask you to multiply them, multiplication is easy. Actually, if I give you like a one hour or so, then you can, you should be able to do that. If you plug into computer, it's, uh, it's much faster. It's like uh, it can be solved within a second. But if I give you 200 digits of um, digits number, if I ask you to factorize uh, this number into two uh, integers, it turns out to be very, very hard. Okay. In general, it's uh, considered to be um, exponentially hard with the exponential in, the, in terms of the number of digits. So, so normally we assume this kind of, uh, we call the computational assumptions, okay? So then there's a problem here. That's the, because the problem might be hard today. It might not be hard tomorrow, or it might be hard for you. It might not be hard for other people, especially for the hackers. So there are lots of codes here, I put it here. So for example, cryptography, cryptographers do not speak well. They are really paranoid. And also we have a quantum computer coming up. So, and then it turns out to be very, very powerful. And then sometimes we can break like an uh, ISA system, okay? So for, well, let me give you one example. Uh, in the Second World War, so the German, they have, a, they have a machine, encoding machine, encryption machine, they call it Enigma machine. So it's, uh, it's uh, they use lots of different kinds of combinations, like 10 million billion possible combinations. It looks like uh, almost impossible to break. And then align, from align the point, uh, align, they get one of this machine somehow because this this machine is also used in the commercial, uh, uh, in the in the commercial product. So with uh, some modification, they get one of this uh, machine, and then they build up a, a, a new machine called Bomb B, and then they break it, break the the enigma machine. So uh, actually, it turns out that uh, this uh, Bomb B, this machine becomes the. Uh, becomes a uh, kind of forerunners of the modern computers. So actually, uh, Alan Turing uh, leading, uh, so uh, he was the one of the leaders uh, to, to break this system. So from here, we can see that when you design the system, you cannot really, um, uh, you cannot really uh, anticipate that what kind of hardware your adversary or the hackers they have, okay? Mm -hmm. Let me give you one example. For example, and especially for some of the data, some of the data is the requires long-term security. For example, uh, the, some of the government secrets like, uh, like nuclear weapons or let's say, or some of the privacy like uh, uh, personal health data, okay? So personal health data, then that kind of data should be, should be kept for, um, for, for secret for like decades, like 70 years, let's say, 70 years. It's a long time, it's a really long time. So here's a problem. So maybe, maybe the hacker cannot get a message, cannot decrypt the message now, but she can save the message uh, for, for, for today's transaction. And then she can save the message. And then maybe many years later, like, let's say 70 years later, 70 years later, 
she gets more, much more powerful computer, much more uh, smart algorithms to decrypt this message. Okay, but keep in mind that we need to keep this secrecy for for seventy years. How can we do that? Okay, so then whenever you design any crypto system for that kind of purpose, then you have to think about that uh, this message, this encrypted message, cannot be cannot be broken within seventy years. Okay, so you have to you have to expect what kind of computation power we have from seventy years from now. Then in order to answer that question, let's take a look at the Morse law. Okay, so we know that the Morse law. Uh, there are lots of uh, 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 there are different kind of arguments here. Nowadays, is uh, more or less is uh, lots of people claim that uh, it's the end of the Morse law, but still it's working well uh, until like uh, currently until probably until the quantum computers probably. And then it's, so it's increased exponentially. Maybe because it's increased ex exponentially, we can still predict. What kind of computation power we have in 70 years? That's okay. That's okay. But that's still very dangerous because if you look back 70 years from now, what kind of computers we have? It's uh, from the 70 years ago. It's actually we don't even have a comp uh, computer. But the first computer is a, it's a size of a huge lecture hall, okay? and also the the computer the computational power is much less than the cell phone we use today, okay? The cell phone we use today. Now we want to, we try to, uh, and we want to uh, give uh, computer power limit on the, on the, on the, uh, on the, on the computers, on the computers, uh, uh, let's say uh, 70 years from now. It's a big question mark. It's ridiculous to, 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 to do that. It's very, very dangerous. And also we know that we have a quantum code breaking. Okay, nowadays it's a very hot topic is that we build up quantum, uh, quantum computers. So we expect that we have a decent uh, quantum computer maybe within 10 years or, or maybe in 20 years, something like that. And we have to be very, very careful about those, uh, those long-term security, okay? Like a short algorithm. All right, so that's a problem. That's a problem in the, uh, traditional conventional cryptography. The, the problem is that if you look at the, the building, the, the foundation, its foundation is, not, uh, its foundation is not solid. It's based on the computation power, but it's very hard to predict the computation power many in the, in the future, okay? Okay, I will, I will change the subject to something else, from the entanglement, okay? Later on, I will combine these two together, okay? Well, enta entanglement, entanglement. So there's a big debate. We know that in the early, uh, during the early stages of the uh, development of uh, quantum, uh, quantum mechanics, there's a big debate between Einstein and Bohr. And then uh, the core of the debate is that the, whether there exists intrinsic randomness or unpredictable randomness. So the idea that's the, um, so there's a famous quote that the Einstein says that the uh, God does not play dice. And uh, Bohr replies this, I was stop telling God what to do, right? So that's a very famous quote. And then you can search it probably in different forms. So what's the, what's the debate? What's the, what's the, what's the main, main debate about? So it's, it's, it's about the case that's the, okay, suppose, suppose we have, uh, you, suppose you build up the uh, system, okay? You build up a system yourself. You build up this system, okay? Quantum system, let's say. Let's assume it's a state. It can be described as state, okay? Any system can be described by a state. And also, you have a measurement tool, okay? Let me let me let me try to find this out. Okay, let's say a ruler, ruler. So you also have a you find a ruler. So that's your measurement tool. So you build up a system yourself, and then you have uh, you also have a ruler. So. You basically you have the you build up the system. You have the state. State means that the it it contains all the properties of the of the system, all the properties, okay, of the system. And also we have a ruler, try to measure it. Okay. The question is the given a state, given a known system, given a known system, it's a given a state, and also given a known measurement device like a ruler. Should the outcome be predetermined? So without even read out the read out the outcome, you should be able to predict it. Okay. So this is a quite it's kind of obvious in the classical mechanics or Newtonian mechanics. 
Because if you get a state, you know everything about the system. Of course, you can. It can give you all the information about the system without really read out the measurement uh, outcome, right? Okay, so that's the that's the that's kind of uh, uh, natural in the classical uh, mechanics, and also it's very natural in our daily life, right? So if you know all the property of a system, it means that the no matter what kind of measurement you put on, you should get the you should. Uh, uh, you, so let's say, let's say, so let's say you build up a system and then you want to measure the length of the system. Of course. So if I measure the length, I ask you that the, can you predict the, my outcome? Of course, you, you, you should say yes, right? You build up the system, you know the length, right? So that's a, that's an idea. Uh, unfortunately, in the quantum mechanics, uh, that's not true. Even given a known system, given a known measurement device, the outcome, it can be still unpredictable. Outcome still can be still random. Okay, so that's a point. That's a debate, that key debate between Einstein and Bohr. Okay, Bohr insists that, okay, why not? It could be predetermined, it could be unpredictable. Okay, all right. And then later on, a few years later, like, uh, 1935, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, they come up with the paradox. We call that nowadays we call the EPR paradox. They change that's the they change that's the okay. You don't know the answer, or it looks like the answer, the outcome looks like random. It's not because it's not because the, the physics physics it's it's natural, it's intrinsic, it's not intrinsic. It's only because you do not know, you claim you know all the properties of your of your system. You don't. There are some hidden variables. There are some hidden variables. You don't know. That's why when you perform the measurement, the outcome looks like uh, random to you. Okay. All right. So it's called a local hidden variable. Hidden variable. You don't really, you, you you don't know it because you, in the experiment, if you get the results, it looks like random. It's only because your knowledge is not complete. Okay. So that's the idea. And also, they take one step further. If if you if you insist that the outcome is unpredictable or it's random, then there will be very, very weird scenario. They call the, Einstein calls the spooky action as a distance. So if you have a pair of particles, if they, are, if they, they, have, they have some interaction, due to some conservation law, let's, let's say uh, momentum conservation, okay, angular momentum conservation, then the spin, one of the spin is up, then the other spin must be down. Okay, let's say, think about the singlet, okay, singlet, up, down, down, up, okay, L left, right, right, left, okay. And then if you separate this pair of the spin, separate even very, very far away, then there seems to me that, it seems to Einstein that the, if you put some measurement on one, one particle, you will instantaneously affect the state of the, the other particle, something like that, okay. He called, he called spooky action. Spooky action. Okay, so that's a big challenge. That's a big challenge because at that time we know that nothing can travel faster than light, right? Okay, so that's a claim. That's the, from the relativity. Right? Okay. All right, 30 years after this uh, paradox, John Bell, John Bell, so uh, 1965, John Bell proposed this uh, Bell's quality. So because that debate is still in the, in the kind of uh, philosophical level. So John Bell puts it in the uh, observable level. Okay. So you can really put it, put this debate in one experiment. This experiment can tell who's correct, who's wrong. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, Bell's is not easy to uh, explain. So I will, I will transfer to something else. Nowadays, we put it here, we call the non local gain. gain. So this is a very easy to explain. All right, so again, at a spot. So we always have uh, two players at a spot. Okay, assume. So you and your friend, so you, you, you two uh, ask you to, to play some game. Okay, non -local, we call it non local game. How do you play the game? So first of all, you, you, so you, 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 you two can meet first and then discuss some strategy. And then I will separate you two into two rooms. Okay, you are not allowed to do any communication. Okay, no communication. Okay, how can we guarantee that uh, two particles they cannot talk? It's very easy in physics. 
as long as we separate them very, very far away, very, very far away, and then we do this game very, very fast, we know that the information cannot travel faster than light. So as long as you separate them very, very far away, during the game time, it's, it's, uh, you don't get enough time to do communication, okay? So then we can guarantee it's, uh, there's no communication, okay? All right, all right, you to play the game. How do you play the game? It's a, uh, it's a, so then each of, uh, each of the players, Alice will be given a bit X, okay? So the referee will give Alice a random bit X, X is a bit, zero or one. Uh, and then ask Alice to output another bit, A, A again is a zero or one, okay? So similarly for Bob, Bob will be given a, another bit, one, random bit, zero or one. And then ask Bob to output uh, outcome B. How can they win the game? They can win the game if A plus B modulo two, XR, XRB equals to X times Y, okay? Then you win the game, okay? All right, it, it, the game should be simple to, to understand, right? Okay, so think about that as X times Y because X and Y, they are random. So X times Y, only when X equals one and the Y equals to one, X times Y equals to one, right? So there are four cases of input, four cases of input, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, right? Only when the both input is one, then X times Y is one, right? So one, one very simple strategy as Bob can do is that they always, no matter, no matter what kind of X, Y they get, they always output zero. So they make sure that A is zero, B is zero. They always output zero. Then what's the probability for them to win the game? As I, as I just mentioned it, because uh, there are four cases uniformly distributed. There are four cases. Then only one case, they will lose the game. So it's not hard to see that with that strategy, they can win the game with 75% uh, probability, right? Okay. I hope everyone can understand at this point. If not, so just uh, let me know, just uh, pop up your question. Okay, it turns out that uh, this kind of uh, very, very straightforward strategy, this very straightforward strategy, is that it's already optimal. It's already uh, optimal. Three quarters. Three quarters is the, the best you can do with your friends. Okay. Okay. All right. I will, I'll give you a few seconds. Okay. First of all, this is a Nanoku game. So Alison Bob, so you and your friend, I will I will put you two in two separate rooms and uh, you, you two are not allowed to do communication. Each of you will give given a bit and then ask you to output a bit, okay? Okay, okay, so that's a, that's a scenario. And then the best you can do is that you win the power, uh, your winning probability is the three quarters, 75%, okay? All right. It's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's, so actually the, this proof is very easy. And actually, if you, if you like it, you can just go back and uh, try this game. And then you will see that the, uh, the proof is not, not difficult. The proof is not difficult. Okay, now let me change the story a little bit. So I said that the U2 cannot win the game beyond 75%. It's not entirely true. If, if you and your friend, you have the, quantum, you have some quantum devices, okay? Some quantum device. Again, so this quantum device, you, you cannot use this quantum device to do communication, okay? But it's entangled pair, we call it entangled pair. So you entangle some particles together and then separate them. You keep one of the particles, your friend will take another particle, okay? And then you do the game, okay? So with this entangled quantum resource, these quantum particles, it turns out that you can win the game beyond the 75%. So the quantum limit is the two plus square root of two divided by four. So which is more than more than 80%. Okay, if you have so we, we can see that there's a finite gap between the classical limit and the quantum limit. Okay, so this is the number of game. So from here we can see that the, so from here we can see that uh, there's some, there's some correlation it's very, very strong. This kind of correlation cannot be explained by any classical correlation. We call the entanglement. We call the entanglement, okay? 
So I assume that some of you have already heard of the main entanglements like uh, you know sci-fi movie or something like that. But let me let me just uh, uh, let me just clarify some of the common misinterpretation of the entanglement. First of all, entanglement cannot be used to do communication. So actually, actually in physics, no information carrier can travel faster than the speed of light in vacuum. Okay, that's called the C. Okay. Speed of light, I will just for short. Okay, that means the information cannot travel faster than light. Okay, so that's the most accurate statement of the relativity. Okay, so entanglement cannot do that, cannot break this law. Okay, so that's the first thing. Okay. As a corollary, of course, entanglement can also explain the telepathic. Okay, essentially, telepathic is kind of uh, you can communicate faster than the light, right? All right, so as I said, that's the okay because in the previous slides we already know that in this nano game, without a communication, you can already, you can already without this communication, you can already um, do better than the classical strategy. Right? Okay, so then we can see that um, there's some correlation, quantum correlation is stronger than any classical correlation. Okay, we call it entanglement. Well, in, so entanglement it has been uh, has been discovered in many systems like uh, photons, like uh, spin atoms. Okay. So this this is a, we call a non-local correlation. So this correlation is quite non-local. So even you separate it very far away, they are still correlated. Although this correlation cannot be used to transfer information, but still it's correlated. It's stronger than any classical correlation, and also the result is unpredictable because I think about that the. Uh, Think about the debate between the Einstein and the ball. Okay. Uh, but it's really it's not for instantaneous communication. Okay. Actually, it's it's not uh, the discovery of the entanglement. Actually, it's uh, it's even before before the John Bell's uh, Bell's inquiry. Okay. There, so there were different. There were if you we check out the literature in history. Actually, a uh, long time ago, many years ago, like uh, 70, 70, 80 years ago, uh, there were already lots of evidence. People already observed entanglement. Okay. For Belgian quantum test, on the other on, on the other side of that, that we have tested this Belgian body in different kind of scenarios in the last uh, like 40 years. So the latest one is like uh, from 2018. So I joined this uh, we call the big bell test. So the point that's the okay. So the point that there's one challenge for this uh, nano game is that's the. So the challenge is says that's the okay. How can you make sure that the this input, this uh, this uh, x and y input, they're random? Because if you do not trust, if we do not trust quantum mechanics, nothing is random. So then the only thing we can think of, so not only thing, so we can think of many many ways to generate random numbers, okay, without trusting quantum mechanics. So one way is like uh, our free will, or free will. So if I if I use uh, my mouse to click a right click or left click, so I can choose freely, okay? So if we trust that, so we can ask human, human, human being to input, uh, input this X and Y, input X and Y, and then we do the X one. So this is what we call a big bell test. We ask for 100,000 people around the world for volunteers. They will randomly click zero, one, one, zero, for one day, 24 hours, all, all global. For one day. And then three, 30, uh, 13 experimental teams working on the, on the test simultaneously on that day, single day. And then, of course, the result is not surprising. That's the, if I, it's always, we always have a violation of the balancing quality test. It's always proven that the uh, Einstein's local hidden variable model is not correct. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at the entanglement. So um, I assume that's not all, all of you are familiar with this uh, broadcast notation. So I will just give it uh, very roughly. So this, uh, this uh, nowadays we call EPL pair. So this, uh, this uh, entangled pair, we call EPL pair. So one of the states can be written as the zero, zero plus one, one, okay? Okay, you don't have to understand it, but uh, so that's the notation. Okay, so again, it's uh, non-local, it's a non-local entanglement. All right, keep in mind that the local hidden variable model is already lured, lured out by Bell's quality test. Because if you assume 
local hidden variable model, you cannot go beyond the 75%. As long as you go beyond the 75%, definitely there's some random base. And also there's some non-local correlation. So keep this in mind. So there's something, it's, it's a, something has a very, very strong correlation. It's stronger than any other correlation. So that means that's the, and also it's a random, it's random in nature. And also it cannot be if dropped because if anyone can if job, if job this, uh, if job this system, the outcome, then if job plus knowledge becomes a hidden variable, right? But it's already been ruled out. So if we put these three properties together of entanglement, put them together, compare, let's compare to the, 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 the first part of the lecture, the cryptography key. Cryptography key requires that the, requires that the, as above, they share the same key, right? When, when we say share the same key, it means that they have a strongly correlated, right? It's similar, right? So it's connected. Right? And also we hopefully this key is private as Bob. As Bob, they know the key, but no one else know the key. Here again, it can be guaranteed because if anyone knows the key ahead, predict the key, then that's a hidden variable. And also it's random in nature. So if we put everything together, turns out that the entanglement, especially this uh, we call the EPL pair, means perfect key, perfect symmetric key, right? Okay. Of course, uh, the, the, the magnetic behind this, uh, this connection, it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, due to time limit, I have to skip that. I, I put a slide here, I put a slide here. It's, uh, it's published in, uh, uh, in the 1999 and the 2000, okay. Um, so actually, uh, in terms that can be used for, we, we so-called quantum teleportation, okay. In the uh, sci-fi movie, we always see, uh, we, we, we always uh, uh, get this uh, idea of a te teleportation, like a, like a beam me up, right? But keep in mind that the quantum teleportation teleports quantum state, not materials. Okay, it's not really um, send some materials over. It's really teleports the um, state. And also it's not instantaneous transportation. It's still, you need to send the class information through the channel. Okay, keep in mind that. Okay, so that's the picture of the teleportation. There are a bunch of other quantum, uh, quantum mix like uh, Discord, Steering, uh, Coherence. Okay, Coherence lately is uh, quite popular, used for quantify the random mix, et cetera, okay. All right, so what's cryptography? Okay, uh, probably I, I am running out of the time, so uh, I will do it quickly. Okay, BB84. So that's the think about that. That's the starting point of the starting point of the uh, quantum information. All right. So um, here, I assume that you know a little bit about the quantum mechanics. Okay, basics about quantum mechanics. So Alice sent out uh, photons to Bob. Think about that. Qubits, photons. Okay. So send out the polarizations. So there are she chooses four polarization, horizontal, vertical, 45 degrees, uh, minus 45 degrees, okay? So for, she randomly chooses these four polarization, send to Bob, okay? So she will record uh, the polarization. And then when she choose horizontal and the 45 degrees, she calls the bit value is zero. And then if it's vertical and the minus 45 degrees, that's a bit of one, send to Bob. Bob from the measurement. We know that the, we have the polarizing beam splitter. We can separate these two polarization and measure it, okay? Measure gets some value. Of course, Bob does not know the basis of the at uh, state set. So he randomly choose the basis. When when they choose a different, uh, when Alice send one basis, Bob match the other basis, then they will get a random result. So after that, after this quantum transmission, they they have uh, some classical connection, uh, compare the basis and threw away the bits when they choose a different basis. Okay, like this one. The rest is the same. Okay, so that's the, in the original paper, it says that's the, okay, if someone, if want to attack the system, uh, let's uh, think about uh, one naive attack. If just measure the, measure the polarization, like randomly with the basis, then she will inevitably introduce some error. Because uh, because uh, consider the original protocol that uh, Alice and Bob with post-selection, they always choose the same basis. 
But Bob does not know ahead which basis they choose. If she choose randomly, if she choose the wrong basis, then she will have 50% chance to introduce an error. Okay, sorry. So for, for this case, it's like a front pole. Think about the full space. And send out horizontal. If, unfortunately, if match the, uh, we call the, uh, we call the diagonal basis, diagonal basis, and then we send the one of the states to Bob. Bob again match the vertical uh, rectangular basis, then he will get a random result. A random result, then he will get one. Then they figure out, so, okay, it should supposed to be no error, but somehow there's some error. So they threw away and then do it again. Okay, so that's the key distribution. That's how they distribute the key. All right, so first, so there are a bunch of observation here. First of all, it's a random keys are distributed through the via um, quantum systems. Okay, so Alice does not send a message directly. So of course, it's random, random key, random bits, right? So they can discard the key if they feel the channel is insecure without causing any security problem, right? Um, so what's a, in that case? What's a free, what's a successful attack by you? If it has to obtain a non trivial amount of the information about the key without the Alice Bob notice, because if Alice Bob notices it, then they can throw away and do it again. Okay, so that's quantum cryptography. Okay, the proof essentially follows the, the entanglement uh, I, I just mentioned, uh, the EPRP, uh, that kind of a picture. Okay, I, I, I don't have time to go through it. But um, if you go through a mess very carefully, we, we can see that uh, what's the foundation for this uh, security? Of QVD, it's quantum mechanics. So we know that the quantum mechanics is quite solid, right? So today we have no, there's no experiments uh, evidence to show that the quantum mechanics is incorrect. So even in the future, maybe uh, maybe we develop the physics and then make a, make it an even bigger uh, theory. Then we assume, uh, so we uh, we ask, uh, anticipate that the quantum mechanics is still correct, maybe in a, in a bigger theory. So it's much more solid than the computation power assumption, right? All right, so I will give you some take home message. Okay, just um, make sure that I don't, I, I don't deliver the long message. First of all, quantum system, quantum communication system deliver, deliver distributed key. Key is a random bit, okay? So that, so it's just only for the key distribution. So it cannot replace all the crypto system. We know that's crypto system. We have lots of applications other than one and We have authentication. We have uh, we have access control. We have uh, uh, we have a signature, bunch of that. So it can so QED is only offers a means to distribute key. That's all. Okay. So I don't want to overclaim. Okay. And also QED does not cannot replace. So sometimes we call the quantum communication cannot replace any class current communication because uh, today we still use uh, classical communication for QED. All right, what's the ideal key? What's an ideal key? It's, it has to be identical and Bob share the same key. And also it has to be private if hacker does not know about the key, okay? We have a bunch of post-processing, okay? Also, there are lots of uh, developments of the, uh, developments of the, um, uh, development of the, the, the this, uh, this uh, QVD area. So this is a picture I took 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago when I was a PhD student, when I just started my PhD. And then we can see that at that time, we already have a big, two big box. That's an Alice and Bob box. And then also, we, you, you, at that time, we can already, we already, we, we, we bought these two boxes from the market. It's already commercialized 15 years ago. Today, of course, there are a bunch of uh, uh, com commercialized uh, companies selling these kind of devices. And also nowadays, people are working on this, uh, working, working to, on, to, on, on, on the QVD device into chips. Okay, without this big box, just chips. Okay, make it much more, uh, compact and uh, also people make the quantum random number generator even uh, on the cell phones. Okay, so it becomes quite practical. And then even the UK, so I want to make some local news. So there's a bunch of uh, uh, projects working on their, this uh, in the in this uh, uh, in the in, in this area. They're also working on the uh, uh, this backbone construction, uh, connecting Cambridge, uh, Bristol, and a bunch of other places. Okay. And uh, we also have the quantum satellite, so launched uh, by the uh, uh, University of uh, Science and Technology of China. And also we have a backbone construction between Beijing and Shanghai. So basically there are lots of developments. So I skip a lot of them like, uh, like uh, in Europe and the US, Canada. So lots of uh, constructions, I'll just skip it. 
So in the future, we will try to really connect it by all the quantum key distribution systems, like with the satellites and also backbone constructions. Okay. So due to time limits, I have to skip this uh, skip proof point. Okay, actually it's not that difficult if you know the basics about the uh, qubit representation, like a broadcast notation. Okay, I'll skip it directly. Okay, so, so and then the question that's, uh, what, so in the, in the field, it seems it's, we already have a commercial device. I'm a scientist. So what's my job? What's, what, what, so what, what's my daily job? So what I'm working on, okay. So again, let me emphasize that the uh, theoretical security does not mean practical security. So in practice, we still have lots of loopholes. We, we have a device imperfection. We have a malfunction of the device. Or sometimes we even, we can think of uh, the manufacturer. They, they might put some malicious loopholes in their, in their, in their system. Okay. So that's also possible, very possible, right? Okay. So we need to find out all those loopholes. Okay. And then try to make it uh, more secure. And uh, on the other hand, we also want to uh, improve the performance. Okay, improve the performance. And then we want to make the system cheaper and uh, more compact. So that's the, the lots of topics in uh, this one. And uh, we all require this uh, kind of uh, theoretical analysis. How can we put, uh, we put it, uh, the whole physical system in a theoretical framework and then we can prove the security. All right, so that concludes my talk. And then uh, you are very welcome to join and uh, visit our group. All right, thank you. Questions? Uh, thank you, Professor Ma. Uh, I think we all have a better idea of uh, what QVD is right now. So uh, now we can start our uh, q and session. So anyone who wants to ask a question can send your question in the uh, Q&A uh, tab underneath. Actually, Professor Ma can also um, open that oh, up if you, yeah, there's like a Q&A tab underneath. Oh yeah, I already saw that. So I, I mentioned it briefly, like do memory and the computation can see considerations come in. Yes, yes. So um, if it's information theoretical security, then you don't need to care about the uh, this uh, kind of uh, computational power or memory stuff. But uh, if you talk about this, the uh, like uh, current crypto systems, then you have to we assume some limit of the computation power. So so if anyone with uh, more computation power, then they can break the system. Any more questions? Any more question? Okay, we have another one coming. Can we also have a asymmetric uh, quantity distribution? That's a very good question. Um, the problem is that's the, okay. The problem is that the, um, so people are working on that. Actually, um, it's not easy. The problem is that the, we do not understand the quantum computers too well. So, um, so, in order to design this kind of we call the asymmetric asymmetric key crypto system, we have to have a rough rough idea about the uh, the computation power. So all the if you if you think about it, all the asymmetric key crypto system, it's uh, it's based on the computation power. But now if we have uh, quantum computers coming in, then we have to have some idea what kind of computation power we are talking about about quantum computers. So what kind of problems? What kind of problems are hard for quantum computers? So this is not well studied. Actually, we have some idea. We have uh, some assumptions over there, but uh, not many people buy the buy the uh, buy the idea of that the, for some problem like like a so recently like a lattice based crypto system or uh, LWE. So people claim that the uh, it is hard for quantum computers, but uh, since we don't have quantum computers, it's very hard to prove or disprove this kind of assumption. But that's definitely a good question to work on. Okay, that's another one. You were able to recommend some books uh, in the uh, Oh, yep, definitely. So um, one is a Nielsen Charles book. Let me let me try to find it. Okay, if if it's on the research level, okay, some parts is like a, in the Chinese uh, cover, so it should be like this one. So this is a Chinese edition. Okay. 
okay, I will type. I will type in. I will just type in. Um, so this is a very uh, very standard. So this is a very standard textbook, okay? very standard textbook to start with. Uh, and also for QKD, as I mentioned in the, in the first page, that you can, if you want to work on the, give an overview about the dispute, that you can check out the, this collection of papers and also you can check out the review paper. Okay. What is the time horizon in your know, view, seeing the widespread commercial implementation of the information? Um, uh, actually, uh, so, um, Again, so the point that's the, the, the techniques is more or less ready. The problem is that it's still too expensive. For example, one pair of this S Bob, this S Bob, this box. Nowadays, of course, it's already much better. So this one pair of the system, it costs you like uh, in the order of uh, 1 million, millions of the uh, Chinese yuan convert to the, uh, convert to the uh, pounds then divided by 10. So let's say, um, let's say uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of uh, pounds per pair, per pair. So that's quite expensive. So nowadays we expect that uh, this uh, price can be reduced down to like uh, thousands of pounds in the future. But still thousands of pounds is uh, still quite expensive for our uh, just uh, uh, personal life usage. So we expect that this uh, QKD, this kind of uh, technique would be useful in the commercial uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, for the company, big companies, like, uh, and also between the big data centers, okay, uh, because that kind of privacy is very important, and also for the banks, probably not for our daily life until maybe in the future we have quantum internet, we have quantum computers uh, available for everyone, then we are, it's easy to do QED. So nowadays, uh, nowadays the most uh, uh, applicants are. Uh, uh, applications of the applications of the this QPD technology is uh, really on the on the government level and also the military level and some banks as well. It's quantitative vulnerable to many many middle attacks. Um, uh, yes and no. So uh, so in the quantum mechanics, actually we assume if gets everything. So when Edis when Edis send out something some quantum state to Bob, so we assume in the middle if gets everything. So but the man in the mid middle attack, then how can we avoid the man in the middle attack? The point is the when they do the the so basically there are two stages for QPD. One is the we call a quantum transmission. Edis send some state, quantum state to Bob. Bob performs the measurement. After that they will they will do some communication, try to compare the bases and they try to do error correction information reconciliation, privacy application, et cetera. So in that step, they need to do, they need to do authentication, try to identify each other's identities. Okay, so that's how they avoid the man, man in the middle attack. So that's why in the QED, we need to assume an initial key, a short initial key for identity. You need to identify yourself. So in the network, okay. So think about that in that case, some people say that uh, this is not a uh, quantum key distribution, it's uh, really, Quantum key extension. So you really need to uh, assume that that is Bob. They already know each other. So they, they have um, they have authentication. They can do authentication. So normally from in the cryptography, how can we avoid the man in the middle attack is to use authentication. Oh, note that the authentication can be done efficiently. So if you want to authenticate uh, a length of n bits of the message, then all you need uh, in the order of the log of n. It's very efficient, okay. Do you have a hybrid of those the classical, classical and the, the, like a quantum computer? Okay, that's a very good question. So yes, so actually we are working on that, uh, especially in the engineering level. So QKD, there, there are lots of limitations. One is too expensive and also the speed, key distribution speed. It's not as fast as the classical data communication. So in order to support one-time pad, we have to uh, further expand the key. 
So sometimes we use the like uh, uh, some other techniques like AES hybrid uh, QED with AES. So so we use the um, QED to transfer the initial key of the for the AES and the refresh key like uh, very very fast like in seconds. Okay, so that's uh, that's one way to hybrid these two systems together. And also after the key distribution, as Bob shared the key, they can use the key to do lots of other stuff like authentication, secret sharing, lots of uh, lots of other tasks. Those tasks can be purely classical. So basically, it's like uh, you can think of QKD just uh, to do key distribution. How do you use the key? You can think of it's classical crypto system. Okay, okay. it's not completely quantum actually. In today's life, when, when in today's application, we don't use it uh, like a complete, uh, fully quantum. Actually, it's always hybrid. We make it a key, key is always classical. We use quantum means to transfer the key, okay? That's a very good question. Okay, that's all. My connection wasn't so good due to the whole. Uh, uh, so so for this that question, uh, we are actually recording the whole thing and then the video will be released on YouTube on our channel, Quantum Information Society. Uh, pretty soon, I, I assume. So you can uh, check out then. Okay, so are we good? Um, are there any questions? Uh, all right, so for anyone who is still interested in this, uh, you can also check out uh, Zeng Pei's flash talk from week one which is also available on YouTube right now. And uh, for the next weeks, we have more events coming up, including uh, Dr. Piotr Mikdos' uh, talk on uh, quantum games and uh, Jessica Poining's uh, talk. Uh, so if you are interested, please go register and we'll see you then. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor Ma. Bye.